9 a.m. Uh, Sinatra and was on Bing Crosby's radio show around the time he won the Oscar, around the time of the 54 Academy Award. And then again, when he was about to start his own show in, the, in October 57, and they did a duet together of this old song that obviously was a favorite of Crosby's called There's a Long, Long Trail. And this whole time on the bus, I kept hearing the tune. <laughs> From now on, Route 27 is the long, long trail. <laughs> what is that? The lonesome, what's not the lonesome road? Because no. these people were at the end of it when we got there. That's, the that's another, that's another long, long, long trail. Um, well, let's, let's start with your objective when you first wrote the book. And we're going to sell some books and sign them. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Already, people already been lying in commerce. What was your All objective? Favorite. What was your objective with the first edition? And now we've got this new edition with a hundred new pages. <laughs> At that point, there had already been a zillion books about crime, but um, not one of them was about the music. And, I, and uh, uh, plain and simple, that was it. And even even at that point, when I was working on the book, people would ask me, "Why are you doing another book about Sinatra? Yeah, There's already like a dozen of them." Tell the book talk louder. Talk louder? Yeah. yeah. Oh, no, at that point, um, there were already tons of books about Sinatra, but there wasn't one about the music. Everything was about the celebrity. And most of the books were uh, in the mold of Kitty Kelly. They were out to, uh, uh, to bury him rather than to praise him. And I thought, just as a novelty, wouldn't it be interesting to write about what I think most of us are attracted to Sinatra for, which is not the celebrity, which is not the mafia, which is not the Kennedys, which is not any of that stuff, not the marriages, but, but the music itself. And even now, with the, with the exception of Czech Granada, there's still never been another book about Sinatra's music. So uh, that's something. And um, another motivation was the fact that at that point, he was still on the road, he was still active, and a lot of his collaborators were still with us. One of my first jobs for the Village Voice in 1986 was writing Nelson Riddle's obituary. So mm -hmm. I knew that there was like, kind of finite time uh, with which, you know, people were starting to leave us, and uh, Herb Kotler left. The drummer. Yeah, the drummer Herb Kotler died in 1990, uh -huh. right before I started. So I didn't get to him, but I did find an interview with him. And that was another reason for trying to document that era while there was still, uh, you know, before the doors to history were closing. Mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the well, the New York Times said the most important book published by Frank Sinatra to date mm -hmm. uh, when it came out. So, in the big picture, and here we are, Frank died in 98, and he's, there is still a relevancy with Frank Sinatra, I think, anyway, to, and, and even a new generation of people turning on them. In a really large general sense, what was there and still exists about Frank Sinatra that enabled him to make such an intense connection with both men and women. What was he doing that worked so well? Oh, in, in the broadest picture. Yeah, this uh, is the broadest picture. Sinatra was the combination of the greatest musician ever, you know, Yasha Heifetz or Oscar Peterson, oh, and, 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 and the greatest actor ever at the same time. time. Oh, wait, let's, let's talk about, so the greatest musician ever, using a, like a sports metaphor, which I know you're not in sports, but when Sinatra entered the game, being a young guy as a singer, what what did he come to the game with as a musician? And he for, focused on making his musicianship grow, as you point out, all the way through well, the book. The, the musicianship was remarkable. I mean, the sense of pitch, the voice itself, the sense of rhythm, the musical uh, resources. But it's important to point out that those were never a goal unto themselves. There was never music for the sake of music. Uh, his whole motivation was this idea of telling a story and connecting with an audience. And those, to him, those two were the same things. So whenever we talk about any specific aspect of Sinatra's musicianship or his technique, uh, you have to you know, always remind people that that was not the end in itself. That was always part of the process, part of the way of reaching a crowd. And that everything he did, every musical innovation, Every uh, every new idea that he had was in the service of that. I mean, we talk about. I mean, Sinatra loved to use the word phrasing. Uh, no, nobody ever used that term before Sinatra. No, pretty much nobody uses it after Sinatra. It really was not 
It's very much attached to Frank. It's very totally Frank. Frank. If yeah. you go to Juilliard and you study singing, they will. I guarantee you, your professor will not use the term phrasing. Really? That was yeah. That's just a Sinatraism. Um, and I think it comes from the fact that he's I, he's not well. I don't want to say self-taught, but he certainly uh, learns his craft outside of the academic system. What right. shall we say? And but pray, I mean, I, simply I would use the combination of rhythm and lyric placement and all these other things that we could say. But you know, we talk about Sinatra's innova inno innovations and in phrasing. Like I say, the whole idea was to connect to the listener and to tell the story. Um, the famous example that he used about studying Tommy Dorsey's breath control because uh, he wanted to have these longer phrases. Again, he didn't just like longer phrases for the sake of it. He liked longer phrases. And not even just to have longer phrases, but that he could have a phrase at any length he want, so it would be naturally conversational, that it would sound, it would emulate the rhythm of natural speech. And the phrase of telling right, the story. Because, right, in, in, in music, you know, you, you get a, a breakup, you know, every eight bars is a breakup, and in singing you have to usually breathe after every two lines, but Sinatra saw that as interfering with the storytelling process, and... Uh, inserting a level of artificiality there that he was trying to eliminate. He wanted you to think that it was, you know, reality, that it was actually happening to him, that it was actually <coughs> naturalistic. And so if you have the wind power to sing for three lines, four lines, however many lines <coughs> in a row without breathing, then it sounds much more like natural speech, like actual real life. And that was his goal. It wasn't, you know, long phrases and lots of breath just for the sake of it, but it was for this idea mm -hmm. that it sounded like reality, that you could believe it, that it made it, it not, you know, it, it, it eliminated artificiality, you know, it helped people to, to suspend their disbelief, as they would say. One of the things, uh, you know, I, I said before you got in the room, I was just talking a little bit, but my mother had been a Bobby Sox, you know, literally she was born the same year as Frank and was a huge Frank fan all the way. So was one of the screaming kids, you know, waving their arms around, wearing Barbie socks. And so a natural question, in fact, before, the, the day before I interviewed Frank, and if, if you show any of the clips, it's one of my questions, I said, what was there about Frank Sinatra that was different? And so you go all the way back to the 40s, right? My, what my mother said essentially was that I felt like he was singing just to me. <laughs> now, over the years, uh, I have taken, uh, Dozens and dozens. I, I personally have seen Sinatra about 120 times live mm -hmm. oh, from 1960 to 1994. Uh, right? I, I took a lot of people, a lot of people. From, from one of them is in the room, two of them are in the room right now. Mm -hmm. And inevitably, some, some of my guests would say that exact thing that I felt like he was singing to me as he did. That intimacy had not necessarily been achieved by many singers no. prior to Frank. Nobody, nobody. That kind of direct connection. Again, you know, the, the, the use of the breath uh, and stuff like that. And, and again, phrasing it like a guy telling a story and making it musical at the same time. You know, and, and Sinatra almost never, uh, to look at it from the other point of view, he almost never like talk sings a song. It's always musical. It's always yeah. you know flowing. It's always bel canto. Well, if you talk about the acting part, one of the things you point out in the book is that Frank was, unlike, say, Bing Crosby, the, the biggest star before Frank, Frank was really comfortable showing his vulnerability. You point out in the book that uh, Bing Crosby would not say, I love you, would not literally say, I love you directly, if I, if I love you, if I, were, if I could love you, something like that. And Frank would come right out and say it. That, and, in, in a way, I've always thought to use my phrase, like the greatest loneliness that he showed somehow that the greatest loneliness lies in disillusionment. A lot of times when I heard Frank saying that, I had a sense of you know, it didn't work out the way it was supposed to. Well, Rosemary Clooney was, to, to, to drop a big name, Rosemary Clooney was the one who pointed out to me uh, that it was Crosby who always never wanted to come out directly saying, I love you. He was always more comfortable saying, I can moonlight like to come to if I say I love you. There's a conditional attached, whereas Sinatra just comes right out and says it. Yeah. Yeah. Sinatra is much more comfortable showing every emotion that there is. Now, how about the transition that Frank made from, from the big band era, Dorsey? Oh, by the way, if at any point you have a question about what we're talking about, not a general question, but about what we're talking about, 
just raise your hand and then at the end, near the end. Not right. where's the men's room, because I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but the, um, Frank, when he left Dorsey, in a way, helped end the primacy of the big bands. I mean, he had been a big band center. Which is something he never intended to do. I think it's really funny. Um, uh, in 1941, when he was Sinatra, first of all, from the very beginning, he had this vision of the path that he wanted, which was very much inspired by Ben Crosby. Ben Crosby being the only sort of name above the title singer in the big band era up till that point. And Sinatra wanted to do that, and he had this vision. Uh, did anybody here know Gary Stevens? He was an all-time publicity guy. He was older than Frank, and he worked for CPS. And he told me a story about hanging out with Sinatra in like 1940, 41, when he was still with Dorsey. And he said, yeah, at some point I'm going to go out on my own, I'm going to break into pictures, and I'm even going to win an Oscar. He was saying this in 1940. And, uh, but he had the kind of vision for himself. And, um, but he said that looking at the equation of the music industry in 1940-41, it, it, it seemed so impossible that a singer could do something like that. And he figured there was Bing Crosby, and then there was... Nobody else. Uh, the guys like Perry Como. Yeah, like Perry Como, with Dick Bangs, or t Tony Martin, they're all singing with bands. And he figured, well, if I get out early enough, maybe I can grab a spot for myself. Yeah. And I'll be the only other one besides Crosby. Well, he couldn't have known that after he left Tommy Dorsey, then Peggy Lee left Benny Goodman, then Dinah Shore became big. And all of a sudden, Sinatra launched this avalanche of pop singers and completely changed the whole equation of the music industry Although, uh, of course, it still had a big band sound. You know, it still more or less yeah. sounded like the big band era up until really Elvis. But um, yes, yeah, Sinatra totally changed the equation of the industry, which is the last thing in the world he wanted to do because he loved the big band. If you told Sinatra that he was the one who put uh, one of his musicians, I think it was Ted Nash, said uh, he was the one who put the kibosh on the on the dance band business because after Sinatra. You know, all of a sudden, the, the big band seemed irrelevant. Everybody wanted to hear singers like, you know, like Frank Sinatra. You know, when I asked that question about, you know, were the tools that, that Frank had when he entered the game, the, and, and what you just said about uh, his having that vision for himself, two things. One, Pink Crosby famously said about Frank Sinatra, a voice like that comes along once in a lifetime. Why did it have to come along in my lifetime? <laughs> <laughs> and the other thing, to get back to the, the question of, what Frank entered the game with, he entered the game with driving, burning ambition. To understand the success of Frank Sinatra is to understand a highly ambitious, driven person, which is a positive thing, not a negative thing in our society, as long as you got the talent, which he did have, in, in order to, to, to back it up. Um, another point, uh, Billy May pointed out to me, that when Sinatra left Tommy Dorsey and went out on his own. Uh, obviously, the role model for everybody was Ben Crosby, and um, Billy pointed out that Dor uh, Sinatra, to distinguish himself at a time when um, Crosby, his basic orchestra, had four violin players, Sinatra always insisted on never less than 12 violin players, mm -hmm. just because he wanted a different sound. He didn't want to sound like a big band singer. And that's one of the reasons that in the Axel Storl era, the 1940s, uh, when Sinatra was on Columbia Records, he wanted this, uh, like I say, more bel canto, this kind of softer sound, more ballad-oriented, and he deliberately wanted this big, string-heavy, kind of 20th century classical kind of a sound in order that he wouldn't sound like he had just left Benny Goodman, or that he wouldn't yeah. sound like another big band. That's it, that's isn't, it. isn't that interesting? Yeah. Of course, sure. later on, he brought the big band sound back. You know, yeah, well, I saw it. Frank, it, it was a period of time when he was touring just with Brass. He did many sprints. That, that, I heard it because Barbara wanted to save the money for the string section. <laughs> I, actually, I actually did hear that. You know, but that was like From 1980. From a string player. That was like 1980, though. Yeah. Barbara, that... Uh, yeah. Well, I think so. I heard. like that hot band sound. <laughs> That's what we're talking about. And there's this great... We're going b over to the other end of the Sinatra career. Well, you hear it in the Basie Live album, which is a great album. You sound. mean the uh, 65? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, of course. But... Um, in 80, around 80, when Vinnie Falcone was conducting for Frank, he went, he really got re-energized. I know Bill saw him many times at this point. I saw him once or twice. Some of Frank's time. greatest singing, vocally, was in the 80s. Yeah. There was a point when Frank, Frank came back from retirement when I interviewed him 
He didn't come back for my interview, but <laughs> <laughs> he came back to retirement in uh, in like '74. How old was he? Hmm? He was born in 15. He when he came back? He was yeah. in 66, 67. He, yeah, he's, turn, he, he's back to turn 60. Nine, turning 60. And he told me the night I met him, he said, you know, I felt the year and a half I was retired, quote, it all fell down. And he said, I'm still, and it's a metaphor Frank used a lot in his life, fighting, fighting my way back. You know, he, was, he said he was working with Robert Merrill a little bit, even in, in the interview, he said that. But he heard something in his voice diminishing right. and set out in the 80s, not the entire decade, yeah. but at least in the last five years. 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 There are recordings of Frank at the Spectrum in Philadelphia in 1985 where he is hitting, he is hitting the end of my way where he goes my way and then goes up to an F, big yeah, note, yeah, yeah, really at the end, colossal. Colossal chops in the 80s. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, there's a concert of uh, Sinatra in Tokyo in 85, connected by conducted by Joe Parnello and Chuck Renata and I, who listened religiously to every Sinatra concert ever. Every yeah, recording Chuck ever. does a show with Nancy. Nancy and when I say Nancy we we listened religiously, we literally lit, lit candles and dobbins. <laughs> That's how religiously we listened. And he's Catholic. Um, uh, there's this one concert in 1985 that we decided is the best Sinatra performance ever. Now, I don't know, this was 20 years ago we decided this, but uh, that's how great he was in that 80s period. He was especially jazzed, I think, because uh, he had Vinnie Falcone, who was a new young guy, and there were, it was kind of a fresh period for him, and he tried touring with the band without strings, which again was a fresh approach, and he brought out all this oddball stuff, like he started doing a porgy and best medley, he did Lover Come Back to Me. He did all this unusual stuff. Uh, the, the early 80s yeah. were a great, great, sort of one of the last <coughs> great Sinatra periods. Yeah. That's yeah. frequently, frequently not. He toured with Buddy Rich at that point, remember? Yeah, yeah. so I saw him with Buddy Rich. At, at least, Bob, didn't we see Frank with Buddy Rich? I think. I did. I saw him at the Buddy, Buddy Rich at a convention, convention hall in Philadelphia. Uh, That's the, by the way, the concert for the Americas is a great, great video from that period. I think that's yeah. 83. That's a so long cool. show. At that that's point, a wonderful show. that was the largest audience that had ever that's attended. Ever a paid concert. Ever the attended. largest paying audience paid for any concert. performance in the history of music. Mm -hmm. could, we, yeah. well, could we the take Dominican a... Republic. Could we dive into um, one little clip from from my work with Frank? What a rip. Well, here's what I was thinking. Since um, mm -hmm. we're talking about Frank's emotional impact, okay, um, Stephen, if you could get the, the little computer back up for the emotional gratification. There t there's two things here that fully support, I think, what we're saying. One of the things I was curious about with Frank was to ask him about could he analyze to himself the actual gratification he gets from his work. I mean, there's a little bit of a joke that he could do it. But then he goes on to say, what does it pay off for him? is when someone in the audience can connect with what he's actually singing about, what he's actually doing. And so here you have two things. You have Frank talking about, personally, what he gets from the audience, and then I think a vivid example, and I remember when we did this at Patsy, we both looked at each other. This is, this is Frank then immediately going to singing the Jimmy Webb song from what, the late 60s? Didn't we? Didn't we? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, the late 60s. So let's go to emotional gratification. Just a, 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 you'll see a considerably younger me and a considerably more alive, Frank Sinatra. <laughs> just a brief, a brief bit there, and then uh, didn't we? Interview number one. Emotional gratification. I must be on page two. Hit more, yeah. That's the second one. There we go. I'll get out of your way. Ah. At all on oh for you personally the emotional gratification that you get out of doing what you do no. going down all the different roads and, and musically on the stage the happy stuff the sad stuff you can get a hit you can write a hit for me actually wrote my bar in the park and did this on that album but anyway back to what we did. just deconstruct what we just saw well i mean that to me was a very potent emotional performance where you see frank fully Involved in, in a way, processing the feelings of what he's saying. Mm -hmm. Well, you were, you were uh, 
mentioned to me about Ava Gardner. Yeah. As as a as a detour. No. It's how how many? You don't have to actually raise your hand for various reasons. But how many men in this room have had their heart broken by a beautiful woman? Do they have okay. to be beautiful? No, no, I would say beautiful. <laughs> I would say. And then another show, another non-show of hands, and how many men in this room can sing like Sinatra? <laughs> you see what I'm saying? The point is not that uh, you had the experience, but the point is what you do with it. And Mitch Miller, to give the devil his due, not always, pointed at, not always portrayed as a hero in the Sinatra saga, but Mitch Miller pointed out to me that... Um, the importance of emotion in singing is not what you, the artist, are feeling, yeah. but what you, the artist, are able to communicate. It's not, you know, what's in, inside you, but it's how you get it out. Mm -hmm. and, and as Mitch pointed out, Sinatra had that crack. He could take that pain, that suffering. It wasn't the extent of his feeling that it was necessarily so remarkable, but the way he communicated it to the audience. That's mm -hmm. true. Yeah. Although, the first... Uh, I, I've always had an all those about the thing that Mitch always said, but I first saw Frank as a 17-year-old kid, this was a busboy, you know, my suck in the 500 club, I was astounded at his ability to control the audience and felt during some of the ballads that he did that he was conveying, you know, real emotions. Whether or not, and that's what acting is. Acting is doing things truthfully while feeling emotions. That's, that's like one of the, the definitions of, of acting. But you mentioned Ava. Because didn't Nelson Riddle say, like, Ava taught him how to... Hey, that's a quote from Nelson. What did he say? Well, well, you know, I never traced the source of that quote, but he did say, yeah, it was Ava who taught him how to sing a love song. Of course, again, like I say, he's, he's uh, speaking fancifully, you know. Well, when I, when I interviewed Frank about his approach to ballad singing, which is another clip we won't show it, but Frank said, what I try to do is to put myself, this is verbatim, in the place of a person who would be experiencing that situation at that time and make his case <laughs> through the song. Yeah, he used that phrase. Yeah, my ma case. Make, make, make his case through the song. And I think you saw that. I mean, it was like taking the position of somebody who was a jilted person and they almost faded and they got back together. And it's, it's a 100% believable thing. <laughs> Nelson Riddle. You say <laughs> Nelson Riddle was able to, well, do, you, do you all know who Nelson Riddle is? I don't want to start throwing out names. Nelson Riddle was just one of the, the great arrangers with whom Frank worked when he went to Capitol Records after the big nosedive in, in his career. Had a, a seminal influence on in helping Frank take heretofore swing numbers and make them swing in a romantic way. Well, that's a uh, special fact. We, we started with uh, You Make Me Feel So Young. I always think that the, the two uh, centerpieces of the so-called Sinatra comeback uh, you know, post from here to eternity are Young at Heart and You Make Me Feel So Young. Why Young at Heart? Why young? Well, yeah, it's a song about beginning all over again. It's a song about fresh you know, renewals and, 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 and a rebirth. It, it's all right there in the lyrics. You know? uh, he really... Um, Captured that, and it's it's. Uh, I'm, 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 I won't plug my next book, which isn't going to be out until next year. Hopefully, the next book is a man who's saying unforgettable. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, there's a zillion stories about um, Sinatra and other people turning down songs and then regretting it, but there's only one story about Nat King Cole turning down a song and regretting it. And that's young at heart. Oh, Isn't that okay. interesting? Yeah. The publisher that told me that years ago, Tommy Volando, and um, hmm. uh, which is at the same time, it probably would have been a great record if Nat Cole had done it. But it so spoke to who Sinatra was at that point, young at heart. And um, the publisher told me that after it became a big hit for Sinatra, the next time he saw Nat, Nat like was wearing a tuxedo, but he, he raised his tailcoat and bent over and said, okay, kick me in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, but there's a, million, there's a million stories the other way around. Sinatra turned down Mona Lisa, mm. Sinatra turned down Nature Boy, oh Sinatra, no. everybody turned down, on that, and that call had this freakish gift to pick hit songs, and that's the only time he blew it on a song that became a hit for somebody else. But, um, <laughs> especially You Make Me Feel So Young, because you make me feel there are bells to be rung and songs to be sung. 
Now you can't put it any plainer than that. I mean, this is a song again about starting over, uh, becoming young again, and beginning anew. And he begins the greatest album ever, Songs for Swinging Lovers, with "You Make Me Feel So Young." And I think that's why it became, uh, you know, it's not always a concert opener, but it's always fairly early in the he show. Did, he usually did that frequently in the show. And honestly, seeing Frank, hi George, hi Beth, you need seats. Seeing Frank standing on stage with gray hair, singing, and even with a molding gray, <laughs> I'm going to feel the way I do today. You make me feel so young. Was a, a wonderful. And even, you know, I used to think, God, that's so goofy. Why does he go into Daffy Duck? What's the line? Running around the meadow, picking up all the. Wait, does the Daffy Duck thing in the middle? The list. I, I, I didn't hear that very often. Though, Once in a while, although if you listen to a lot of Sinatra bootlegs and you hear the Daffy Duck voice, Why? Yeah. then yeah. you know it's London. That was London 1970. That's kind of a tip off as to what concert you're listening to. But that voice. And I used to think, God, that's kind of silly, isn't it? But now, it's like, it's obvious what he's doing. He's acting young. He's acting yeah. like a kid. He's being yeah. playful. I mean, um, somebody, uh, sometimes people call it like a, a kind of vocal, musical, onomata, poet, po, onomata, whatever the word is. Yeah. Whatever, yeah. that word. Yeah. And, you know, by you sing a song about being young and you sound young. And you sing a song, you, you know, you make the words sound more like what it is. And he's just doing that constantly throughout that song. He's just playing with it. He's just having such a ball. Well, as long as we're, we were talking about Nelson Riddle. That, that yes, that Nelson Riddle. As long as we're talking about Nelson Riddle, this seminal, important influence on, on Frank, um, you point out that Nelson Riddle found the middle ground between jazz and classical music. Interesting, right? Yes, very interesting. Well, they, they have... Uh, on, on the ballad album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, they have certain things in common, kind of this this, this <coughs> advanced harmonic sense of, of, that Nelson would use that, that you know, uh, applies equally to modern jazz and to uh, contemporary classical music, or more or less, you know, pre the Impressionists and beyond, people like Debussy and Ravel, and that uh, uh, Riddle was influenced equally by the French imp Impressionists as well as by Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn. So he, he really... Uh, was able to bring Sinatra to a whole new height, you know, to this whole thing, and um, really, real. If you have to pick, just like if you have to pick the greatest singer ever, it had to be Sinatra. The guy that did more to orchestrate the Great American Songbook the way uh, we hear it today was Nelson Riddle, who just brought <coughs> such uh, individuality to it, such uh, stylization, uh, just this very distinctive sound. And when you listen to all the great Sinatra Riddle albums, and the amazing thing is, you can hear that it always sounds, you can recognize Riddle no matter what, and yet no two albums sound alike, yeah. particularly in the 1960s, right? Like Moonlight Sinatra Moonlight sounds so nothing like uh, right, you know, know. Strangers in the Night, yeah. for instance. Yeah. They're all so different, and yet they all sound like Riddle. I mean, the guy is just. You know what I think might be interesting? Cause we jumped over something. I, I said, to use the term you use in the book. And Frank Sinatra was weird to a nosedive. What went about 47, 48? He starts declining right after the war and doesn't really come back until. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's a slow nosedive, but it's a slow nosedive. But at one point, 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 I can't assume that everyone knows this. You know this history. At one point, you know Frank was really counted out of the business. Someone saw him walking down the street by himself. Sammy, Sammy, Davis. Sammy Davis saw Frank walking down the street near the Paramount. Yeah, can you yeah. Right? Fans, nobody even saw him. My mother saw Frank at the Lat Casino in downtown Philadelphia before it moved to Cherry Hill. The New York Post, yeah. that wonderful sensitive organ of the <laughs> uh, ran a, had, when Sinatra played the Paramount 51, which was only eight years after the big uproar in 43, said the Bobby Soxes were gone on Frank in 43, but they're just gone in 51. Yeah. Well, what's the reason? What's the reason? Oh, that's what I want to get into. Why did that happen? So first, I'm just to say, to I don't think they use the phrase Bobby Sachs. You're correct. I was paraphrasing. In, in 47 or 48, my mother saw him at the Latin Casino on a Thursday night with 11 people in the audience in downtown wow. Florida. Where was that? Downtown, yeah. downtown Florida. Yeah. At the Bay Deer. Wait, 51? Wow. Around that period of time. So, what I want to do is, I want to ask you to like, chart what led to the nose <laughs> which is interesting because it is interesting. It, it's a very interesting and then 
put together the Alan Livingston thing that took him to Nelson Riddle and the, uh, the resurrection after winning after winning the Oscar. And I'll just I'll, I'll sort of jump in with a little rush work. Well, there was a bunch of different things about uh, the nosedive period. For one thing, I, I talked about that kind of classical sound that he had during World War II. Uh, someone referred to it as a rustle of spring kind of a sound, and invo invoking Delius. And like I say, uh, the French and the British classical composers from that period. Very kind of a classical sound, lots of strings. And uh, he kept doing that without any kind of real change. And people got tired of it, essentially. And at the same time, um, it was becoming clearer that Sinatra was not the sort of naive, young, innocent swain that he was portraying himself to be in all of his MGM movies. This was around the time that... Yeah, he was uh, always like the Dudley Do-Right type character yeah, in those was, movies. Yeah, he was... Exactly. And um, it was clear that that character that he was playing really wasn't the real Frank because, um, you know, his, the, the, uh, the scandal of the end of his first marriage and his affair with Ava Gardner, who's you know, the sexiest movie star in the world, pre-Marilyn Monroe, and I would even say post-Marilyn Monroe. But um, it was just clear that there was a sort of, he was out of step, uh, the music and the portrayal were not in step with the real Sinatra, and audiences were beginning to tire of that anyhow. And Sinatra also later said that I was just faltering in my work. I wasn't you know, paying the attention that I should have, mainly because he was distracted and for other reasons. Sure. In, in sort of the big picture of popular music, uh, one of the important things, I, I, I look at, uh, uh, again, Nat King Cole, I look at Louis Armstrong, Louis Prima, all these different guys, um, one reason that they were able to keep going from one generation to another is by changing the mixture. And um, Bing Crosby, for instance, I mean, there definitely was a Bing Crosby kind of a sound that was consistent, but Crosby always liked to work with different band leaders. He made a session with Woody Herman, he made a session with Lionel Hampton. He was the guy who was always doing that, doing, doing different kinds of duets, always trying to do something different. And Sinatra later got that point, but not that early. He did, kept doing what he had been doing before, and it just sort of, you know, ended on it. I mean, a good example, another comparison point, uh, Dick Haynes, wonderful mm -hmm. singer, really a rival for Sinatra, and again, a guy who kept doing the same thing and wasn't able to find something new to do. Louis Jordan is another example. I mean, he was the, you know, the guy that invented rhythm and blues practically, but he kept doing the same thing too. And even by the time rock and roll came in, Louis Jordan was considered old news, even though all the young rock and roll guys were imitating Louis Jordan. Oh, Louis Jordan. But one of the things I think, just, just one second, sure. then we'll take your question. One of the things I think that people don't realize is that Frank had been essentially a youth culture, like teen idol. Oh, yeah. And teen idols frequently just fall. He, Sinatra had to work to develop an adult audience. And that took a while as part of the transition of doing something new. Yes, your question. Well, I, you just, I was there, okay? Uh, you just hit a good point. Fire! He, he came out, <laughs> he came out, and they developed these bobby socks. And this was 40 or 41 yeah. in that period. And he became a, a, a big hit. He was made these kids swoon. That was his word. Yep. And I remember that I, uh, when Perry Como came, uh, uh, young men, as I was, didn't like Sinatra <laughs> because he was getting all of all this attention for the female. All, yeah. all of these female. Uh, uh, they used to follow him in the street. It's probably the same with you in your youth. Yeah, sure. <laughs> sure. I can and, tell. and now, even now. <laughs> yes, yeah, I was there, and uh, it, then he got out of that, and I think it changed when he took, when, um, when television came in, and he took the, uh, the role in a, uh, um, our time? In a Lucky Strike, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, that Lucky Strike TV show, and that changed his career. I thought he was done at that. Everybody, point. everybody, everybody thought he was done. Everybody. But that, we had another question. Yeah, well, along those lines, I just you were talking about the generations. When you first started out, you had the younger generation, and as years went by, 
Because that, gener that generation stayed with him. But was he able to capture, let's say when he was in his 40s and his 50s, was he able to capture the younger generation, even the those you got years? Me, you know, the interesting thing That's is what that... I know. Well, I, I, I stayed with him all the way, but I don't, I don't know about the younger generation. Where was <coughs> well, I saw Frank when I was 16, 16 almost 17. Which is 10 whole years. Uh, yeah, and uh, Frank was, I don't know, 40, something like that. Uh, 45. 45 years old. Nailed me and my friends. Yeah. Uh, and um, no, but to, to, to answer your question, Sinatra sold more records in the 1960s than any previous time. Mm -hmm. Sold a lot of records. Yeah, I mean, that's when you had Strangers in the Night and mm -hmm. My Way. And, yeah, and plus, uh, very good albums. So. That's why. Yeah, and really good albums. And, and singles, the, yeah. But the, he, he had more sales to right. young people and old people in the 60s, even though we don't think of that as his glory years as much as the 50s. So here's what I want to do. So Frank's in his nosedive. He comes back by his acting talent wins the Academy Award for Best Supporting Actor for Beauty and Eternity, but still the music career comes together it's all, it was all because insane. of Alan Livingston at Capitol Records. I love the story of how he gets the call. It's in your book, right? Well, the story that Al, Alan Livingston, who was the president of Capitol, told me he's unfortunately gone now, but he was a, a really cool guy. Um, he said that, it's kind of funny, uh, that Sinatra's contract had ended at Columbia Records. Uh, his contract had lapsed at um, MGM Pictures. He did a couple of uh, B, almost B movies for RKO and Universal, but really he couldn't get a picture deal. And uh, same, he, the CBS had tried giving him a TV show, but it was not a hit. It lasted for two seasons and really was not didn't didn't you know really achieve anything. But um, so. Sinatra's agent was trying to find him a record deal, and he was going around calling all the heads of the record companies zip by rope, and he was sort of like, uh, so, I don't know, are you interested in Frank? And the guy, and, and Al Living said, well, yes. And the guy said, really? You know, it, was <laughs> like, it was like shocked that Alan Livingston was actually interested. That's how far uh, Frank had fallen. But as, uh, and, and Livingston pointed out, you know, I knew the talent was there. I knew, you know, uh, that, uh, I have another. I don't, I don't know if this story made it into the book, but I, I love this tale. It was not in the original book because I didn't get to meet Bob Wells until after the book came out. But Bob Wells, really great songwriter, uh, his first big hit was the Christmas song, which he wrote with Mel Torme, and of course was a huge hit by Nat King Cole. Uh, in the 50s, he was working uh, for different Hollywood studios, wrote a lot of picture themes, and he wrote the theme to From Here to Eternity. Mm. And he said that uh, he brought it to Frank, and um, the point in the end of the song, only in the end of the second chorus, where he goes, this love that you left me, this endless desire, that's not in the first chorus. He said that was Sinatra's idea, to add that little extra tag at big, the end. Big high note. Oh, yeah, it really big makes the note. record. Yeah. It's a big high note, and it makes the record that much more dramatic and impactive. Anyhow, he said that the, when they recorded the, uh, the song, this was before the movie had come out, obviously. And he said that Frank was really humble and mild. And he said, what do you think, Bob? Do I sing it okay? Do you like that, Bob? Is everything good? And he was very deferential to Bob, who was a younger man than he was. And, uh, and Bob said, oh, Frank, that was great. Don't worry, it'll be fine. He said that he saw him again six months later, after the picture came out, after the Oscar. <laughs> and he was like, hi, Frank. And Frank was like, how you doing, kid? <laughs> totally turned around. I love that story. Totally turned around after from here to eternity. We have a, a we have a clip of Frank singing. Uh, oh, you have a question? Yes. Yeah. Well, well, as a fellow journalist uh, who specialized in entertainment myself, I mean, you talked about how the idea of the book came about, uh, focusing on his music. But given the fact that you know so many of these people who are in the book are no longer with us, uh, what was the biggest challenge of that? You know, tracking people down, tracking down sources, reporting the book, that sort of thing. So as, as long as we do this, I know we're oh, recording Thank this. you, Tripp. Um, this is the book we're talking about. This is about. Tripp's advice. Sinatra, the song is you, the singer's art. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I remember one guy, um, Frank Military, had been Sinatra's, one of his like right-hand guys. And Sinatra did have this big entourage. And uh, Military is one of the key guys in it. And he, Sinatra, had all these publishing firms in the 50s, and most of 
uh, the way he had all these guys hanging around was that he paid them through the publishing company, and most of them were le legitimately involved, you know, with helping him get uh, right. run the publishing company. They weren't just hanger oners. Anyhow, the key member was Frank Military, who ran some Sinatra Publishing, and eventually he got an offer from Warner Chapel, and he told Frank that he was leaving, and Frank said, "Oh, that's wonderful." And he always bragged that he was the only guy that left Sinatra's uh, inner circle on good terms. Because <laughs> uh, Hank Santacola and a lot of these other guys did not leave on good terms, uh, to put it frankly. But when I wanted to interview Frank Military, he had just been interviewed uh, for, for um, Nick Tosh's book on Dean Martin, which is, and, and somehow uh, Nick Tosh, who, who was a great journalist and great interviewer, got Frank to lower his guard and he told all these kind of salacious stories about picking up hookers with Dean Martin in like 1946 and stuff like that. So when I talked to Frank, he was really, really not anxious to, to talk to another journalist. And I had to assure him that I don't, didn't want stories about him and Frank Sinatra picking up hookers in 1946. Yeah. <laughs> um, and finally, yeah, that, w that, was, that was a challenge. Because like, like I say, nobody had ever done a book about Sinatra where the objective was to talk about the music as opposed to uh, the salaciousness, the Kitty Kelly type, uh, pathology type books. So that, that was an obstacle. But um, like I said, I talked to Frank repeatedly and over, you know, I must have done 10 interviews with him, some in person, some over the phone, and he really was a major, major, major source of information. Um, one of the last things that the military was, who was a big friar, as you remember, yeah. the military. Um, the sort of crowning achievement in his relationship with Sinatra was he was the guy who got him to do New York, New York. Mm. Uh, when that song came out in the, in the Liza Minnelli movie, he was the one who sent it over to Frank, and he was the one who called the office every week. When is he going to listen to it? Has he listened to it yet? And finally, yeah, that became Sinatra's sort of last big hit. Big, big, yeah. Last big signature song. Yeah. So that was military. Um, well, all of it's all, it's all circle. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Yes. Sorry. Why did all those mm. inner circle people leave on the channel? Why did people leave on bad terms? <laughs> well, the, I can tell you, um, uh, again, that was not an aspect that I concentrated on, but the famous story is Hank Santacola uh, had been Sinatra's original manager and sort of um, right-hand guy. Uh, they were close buddies, and he was with Frank from the Tommy Dorsey period going forward. And in 19, the end of the 50s, they went into business together on the Cal Neva Lodge. Who and um, the Cal Neva Lodge, yeah. Yeah, which was on actually a, 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 a casino that still exists, built on the actual border mm -hmm. of California and Nevada. So you could actually, in the casino, walk from Nevada <laughs> to California. And there is a there's a book called uh, Rat Pack Confidential by a writer named Sean Levy <coughs> that uh, paints a night at the County of Lounge that could be a brilliant one-act play. Mm -hmm. The players would be Marilyn Monroe, like really in a lush period. She will die two weeks later. Mm -hmm. Joe DiMaggio, not at the County of Lounge, but circling the perimeter because he <laughs> thinks that Frank and Dean and Peter Lovett are having sex with Marilyn. Frank and Dean and Peter, all in one night, plus, I think, Sam Giacana and from the and mob. And John Kennedy and Robert Kennedy. A lot, yeah. Mm. <laughs> and various other Kennedys. So the, the, the Count Neva was a, a frank attempt to go into the casino because he did own part of the Sands right, for right. a while, yeah. So, yeah, but after, uh, yeah, the, 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 between being pressured by the mob on one end and the FBI on the other end, the Count Neva Lodge, Frank's involvement in it was a, a disaster, as somebody would say. And um, yeah, he lost his license. Yeah, he lost his license. It was a, it was a big, big uh, he state, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, Hank Santacola was one of the partners in it, and it just fell apart. And they got very, very mad at each other, and never talked again. And you know, they've been close friends for 20 years at that point. And Santacola, as his way, uh, you know, his when that arrangement broke up, Santacola kept all the publishing which included stuff like Come Fly With Me, Come Dance With Me. Sinatra owned the publishing to a lot of his signature songs, especially the ones that he had uh, commissioned, and Santa Cola kept that. So he got a really, even though they did not part on good terms, 
Uh, Santa Cola could not complain that Sinatra treated him bad. Does he another question? Yeah. Yeah, I was wondering about the connection between Dean Martin and Frank Sinatra. When it started, was it early? The relationship between Frank and Dean? Yeah. When it started, it started pretty early in the 40s. Yeah, Martin they were on the Martin Lewis and Sinatra did some radio shows and stuff like that together. They were they were great pals. Yeah. And, I mean, obviously Dean had a ton of respect for Sinatra. You know, I mean, I think what they yeah, oh, certainly vice versa because they each did things that the other one did not do. Yeah. You know, Sinatra took ever. I mean, he could have fun with music, but he essentially was very serious, very ambitious. Whereas Dean's whole point was, you know, to be as casual, as improvisational, as spontaneous as possible. Uh, and not to take anything seriously. And they each read each other's flip side. And they really had incredible respect and love for each other. It, was genu it really was genuine. It wasn't, you know. We did, a, uh, we did an evening at the Friars Club about a month, five, six weeks ago with De Dina Martin. Dean Martin's, uh, you were there, right? Yeah, and yeah. also we did Dean's birthday. Yeah, and right. we did Dean's not birthday as well at the Friars Club. Not to forget. And that night, uh, Dina Martin, who herself is a good singer, she's a good performer, told the story of. He was, said, Uncle Frank and I, referring to Frank Sinatra, Uncle Frank and I were talking, and, Fra and he said to me, you know, when I take a breath, I can tell how the note is going to be before it even comes out. <coughs> and she said, really? Yes. But he said, does my father do that? And Frank said, your father has no idea what he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> but the you know, the Will pointed out, we were up at Will's apartment looking at some videos once, that if you ever see Frank and Dean on the screen together, Dean is never eclipsed in any way by Sinatra's charisma. He totally holds his own. And uh, he just has the ability to, the camera loves Dean Martin. There's no question about oh, it. He was beyond the natural. But it's, it's that kind of, uh, you know, you have to work to be a natural. I mean, that. Yeah, it's true. There's a, there's a YouTube clip of I just saw it the other night with Dean Martin on the, on the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson and Bob Hope. Nobody is controlling Dean Martin. Johnny, for all of his skill, is like, I'm not sure what I'm going to do next. Bob Hope is just sitting there like that. Dean is saying to, to Johnny, Hi, Merv. <laughs> I know. I know. Uh, he was great. De Dean's whole thing was uh, uh, deflating pomposity, and there was a lot of it at that point. So he, he had his. Uh, he had a whole career. And a wonderful voice. I love Dean Martin's voice. Oh, great it's voice. Terrific. Great, great style. Underrated. Underrated uh, yeah. singing styles. Yeah. Except not, not by me. I rate him high. Mm -hmm. we have any, we're not finished. Any other questions before we move on? I, two things. I want to ask your opinion. I'd like to just show one another music, music clip. Sounds that good to me. You make me feel so young? Or the we three? Saw, or the saw you make me feel so young. I'm sorry. I've got you under my skin. Well, that works. Or the three clips singing like a picture, which are all 60s. Uh, that's like something stupid with men. Which one would you prefer? Which one oh, does the talk? Why don't we get a. Uh, I'll go with whatever the way the wind blows. Um, I could talk about skin, certainly. Yeah, I've got you under my skin. All right. Let's, that's first, let's get the lights straight. <laughs> okay. Okay. And then everything? get it all set up for I've got you under my skin. Give us a little background on this. This is a well. This is this is uh, songs for swinging lovers side B track one. The first side on the first track on the second side. This is to me the archetypical example of this whole process that we call, for lack of a better word, interpretation. Uh, the idea that you could take a song written one way and do something completely different with it, completely out of what the original composer had in mind to begin with. Um, if you ever see, there's a, there's a, a movie called Born to Dance, starring um, Eleanor Powell and Jimmy Stewart. Mm -hmm. A rare musical comedy starring Jimmy Stewart. And, uh, but neither one of them sings this song. Um, the heavy uh, is a woman named Virginia Bruce, who plays this very dark and sultry torch singer. And she sings, I've got you under my skin, page one. So go ahead, no, no rush, keep going. Oh, uh, uh, she sings, I've got you under my skin. Again, this, this is Colt Porter. It's about a year after Begin the Begin, which is from a show called Jubilee. And Begin the Begin isn't really a begin. It's more like a bolero. And I've got you under my skin is the same idea. It's a very sort of slow, romantic, sultry bolero. I've got you under my skin. I've got you deep in the heart of me. 
And to show you the depth of Sinatra's creativity, the whole idea to take a song written one way, a song written as a ballad and make it into a swinger, sometimes to take a song, you know, done uh, rhythmically or, or, or fun or, you know, uh, in some kind of novelty kind of way and make it serious. You know, the idea is just to take it and, and do what you like with it. You sort of create something interesting, something different. Put it back in. Sorry. Put it on the DVD. DVD. Just put it back in unless you can get to the top. Because it's, it's on page one. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll make a couple points about it. I've got to under my skin. Which what version do you have? It, uh, I've got the, from, from the, uh, London? 19, yeah, from the London concert, right? Two, a couple things. First, when I look at, like, there's some great singing out there. It shows, like, the voice. I see singers who never saw a soft note. They got it. Not yet. yet. They never saw a soft when note they want to hit. When you see Freud approach, I've got it under my skin. Look at how softly he begins. He gives himself plenty of room to go. At one point, uh, in the famous you know, bridge there with the trombones come in, he actually turns to the trombone and says, hey, we someplace to go because he thinks the guy may be coming in too loudly. And the other thing is that Nelson Riddle said that the beat of Sinatra was the beat of the human heart. The heartbeat. And so when you hear the basic bass line, right, yeah. you're, you're hearing that specific beat. Yeah, some, obviously some songs are faster than others, but uh, he never does anything like blindingly fast, like Oscar Peterson fast. Like well, I only that one most beautiful song in the world. Oh, yeah, that one. Okay, that, that, that's, that's, that's the exception that proves the rule. Yeah. But, and also, um, as exciting as it gets and as thrilling, he lets the orchestra do most of that. He knows he's not going to come in belting. He's not Judy Garland. Much as we love Judy Garland, Sinatra never comes in belting like that. And he almost never, uh, this is another Sinatra signature, he never ends on a big high note. Yeah. He usually he usually reaches the climax somewhere about a minute or maybe thirty seconds before the end, and I'll get to his emotional epiphany, and then he'll die under my skin. Yeah. So that he's much uh, Tony Bennett is much more likely to have a big a climax. Big note. Which will the bells <laughs> ring? Which is a kind of a Judy Garland type of ending. Sinatra never, almost, almost never, almost never hear well, he, he really a for okay. When he comes back in, goes up, and he's really young below it, I've got you under my skin. One time I saw Frank and a woman in the audience went, whoa, and he said, where does it hurt you, baby? And, like <laughs> and he would also do a reprise sometimes of the end of I've got you under my skin. Every once in a while. Yeah, those quiet, the light, stealth endings. endings. <laughs> I think it was 70. 70, not 70? No, 70. Is November 70? One of the last big concerts that was filmed before the retirement. And uh, hence the Beatle wig. What was up with that? You don't like that. You don't like that well. Well. Remember Marlon Brando said, Frank Sinatra, when they made Guys and Dolls? Marlon Brando said, Frank Sinatra just mad at God for making him bald. <laughs> How about some questions? How about a statement in the form of a question? <laughs> um, well, okay. Let's, so, um, let's focus on the book then. Ah, again, here is a book. We put Look at this. this; it's well read. <laughs> well read. Book. Book. Absolutely. Well read. Um, I love to so see. I'm authors love to see a dog-eared book. Yeah. They hate to see a new, a fresh. Hundred, uh, a hundred additional pages in the new edition. What? When we were working on it in 19, uh, ooh, 1995, uh, the idea was to come out with a book before Sinatra's 80th birthday. We figured that would be a good goal to set. And at that point, A, he was still alive. He was still touring. Um, when I started the book, he, hadn't, he had not yet done the duets album, so it came out while the book was there. So the story really wasn't finished. You know, he was, the career wasn't yet over. Uh, but more importantly, I'm the kind of guy that 
uh, what is what is the, the white queen? The white the white queen is talking to Alice and through the looking glass, and she's talking about her memory of things that haven't happened yet. Mm -hmm. And Alice says, "Well, how can you remember things that haven't happened yet?" And the queen says, "It's a poor sort of memory that only works in reverse." Mm -hmm. And can you say something? So uh, I'm the kind of guy that I need a lot of perspective and. Writing about the, about the recent parts of Sinatra's career, and I was writing in the early 90s, for me to talk about the 80s and the 70s and even the 60s, it was just too new. I hadn't really synthesized all of it. And my whole focus uh, was particularly the Nelson Riddle period, the Capitol years, and even before that, the Columbia years, the Tommy Dorsey years, the Harry James. My whole focus was the earlier part of Sinatra's career. And because of all these things, and because we had a strict deadline, uh, I did not give proper attention, I thought, to the 60s, 70s, 80s. So when the centennial came and I was trying to push a new edition, one of the things I always wanted to do was to go back and deal with those later periods, because I thought I gave them short shrift. So uh, the main, the hundred new pages are almost all, I mean, of course, I, I made some corrections to earlier stuff, but mainly I wanted to give more attention to the albums of the 60s and the later period, because I think I, I, I did not give it all the attention it was due. And, and you'll see that most of the new writing in the book is from the 60s. And you, Tony Bennett wrote the... Uh, yeah, we have a new forward from Tony Bennett. And you, you not were, too shabby. <laughs> you, also worked, you also worked with Tony writing Tony's uh, autobiography, right? Yes, uh, Tony's autobiography, The Good Life, was... Uh, co-written by me. If you see the cover, it says "The Good Life, Tony Bennett with Wilfred Fall," <laughs> which is how it should be, because uh, <laughs> uh, that's the reason people are going to buy that book, and I, I fully support that. Right. But yes, uh, I was really glad to be able to do it again, and also I did something I've never done before, and most likely never will again. But I, I, I wrote a new introduction to the book that talks about my own uh, personal experience with the music of Frank Sinatra, which is by no means anywhere near as interesting and fascinating as Bill Boggs's uh, experience. No, what are you talking about? Oh, because, because no. Bill, well, Bill's experiences really are not only of the music, but of Sinatra himself, which is uh, something. But anyhow, I got to write a whole uh, essay about, you know, how I came to write the book and why I decided to write a book about Sinatra's music. So I'm really proud of that little essay that, it, that introduces the new book, and uh, I hope you'll read that. But, um... Yeah, the main thing was, you know, just, just to sort of correct, you know, make it a better book. I think it's really much important now. I've read it three times. I've read it three times. Well, I've written it three times. can't get it right, you know. <laughs> Beth, yes. Yeah, I, I was wondering why, why did Frank retire? What why did Frank retire? What was the, 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 what was the, the first time? Or at the end of the line? At, at the end of the line. Was it or at the end? Oh, that's a sad tale. Uh, yeah. that's you mean in 1994? You know. It just was time. He was about to turn 80. Yeah. And, um, 98. Uh, no, he died in 90, 94. I saw a second to last Is live last show on New York. Was that Radio City? I saw, no, in Atlanta, Atlanta, Atlanta City. City. I saw the Saturday night show, second to last performance in the United States before he did a charity thing out in Palm Street. That was 95. And he was excellent. Yeah, you know, I saw him a lot of people. Yeah, it, it was Atlantic City where I'd seen him for the first time. He was excellent that night. Um, in the 90s, yes. Frank started to have, um, late 80s but 90s, memory issues. Uh, I don't know whether it was early you know, Tina, Tina, Tina tried to do it with Barbara. I don't know. I I can was, talk he was taking him. medicine for it. You could see, and I was close to people who were close to him. And they said, you know, Barbara changed his medicine, but I, I never looked at it that way. I could see Frank on stage, like, being on top of it, and then in the middle of the act, literally having a drink, and it would throw him off. It would throw him, the alcohol would throw him off. So the people around Frank pretty much said, this is it, that, that yeah, you know, I'm not going to go touring it. anymore. In terms of selling the show, Frank was able to do it. Oh, yeah. All the way. I only saw over the 90s one really show which was inferior. He had just arrived from Germany. He was by himself. Right. He literally, like, got off the plane and was performing at uh, Westbury that night, and he was just tired. You know. So it was it was time it was time to wrap it up. But I know Bobby Marks, 
who was Barbara uh, Sinatra's son from a previous marriage, and someone I knew in New York, uh, was close to Frank, and went out to see him in Malibu, sad, disappointed, during this period of time. And Frank was like not singing anymore, and he was just sitting around. And Frank was watching TV. Bobby walked into the room, and Bobby told me this story. And Frank like didn't even acknowledge it, just like that. Commercial came on, and Frank hit the view, and he looked up at Bobby and he said, if these are the golden years, the golden years suck. <laughs> <laughs> and he hit the mute again and went back to watching TV. So mm. I always felt he could have done a little more work during that period, but the people around him were afraid. Yeah. yeah. Please. I'm trying to remember the year. Good and loud, please. Uh, Liz. 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 Liz from the Friars Club, everybody. Yay. Yay. What was the year? Because I remember seeing he was on a, a tour, it was him, Danny Davis Jr. Eliza, that was like 80, no, 87, 87, 87, 87, 87. That was going to be the Red Pack reunion tour, but Dean pulled out of it. So, so. I remember, and Eliza then pulled out. Right. And it was, and Peggy Lee took her place. No, Peggy that, Lee? That, yeah. that, that did not that? happen. I never heard of that, but if you saw it, you saw you saw Frank Dean and Peggy Lee. No, No, Frank Frank Sammy. Sammy. Frank Sammy and Peggy Lee. Where? Where Oh, I don't know. Maybe City Center. Wow. I don't think Liza pulled out. She might have been sick or something. She wasn't. And so it was Peggy Lee. Wow. And and this is where Frank couldn't sing. He couldn't read the notes. He couldn't remember the words. Sammy had hip surgery. He couldn't dance. (laughs) And Peggy Lee had something wrong, and she couldn't. Can't dance, can't dance, can't dance, can't dance. Wow. Time to sit down and read. But, <laughs> he, but he couldn't hit the notes. I mean, it was very sad, and I forgot what year. I remember going, but I don't remember the year. Mm. Well, at that point, he couldn't. He couldn't remember. I, that was a temporary yeah, aberration. I, I, I heard it many times in the 90s. That's not that a show you saw. But every show was yeah. not like that. Right. right. No, that's that's a show there are more good than bad. Right, but I don't remember that it was at the end of his. Yeah, sure. Or oh, so sure was it the near the end. Yeah. No, I know that. I know. But yeah. at the very end, but he couldn't. It was sad. Any I other? saw him at Westbury, and he was. I took my mom, because she was like this. Mm-hmm. And it was, it was amazing. Yeah. I mean, all he would have to do, I'll never forget, he'd be standing up, and all he'd have to do was like this, and everyone would scream. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that's how it was with yeah, Elvis, yeah. too. Yeah, Elvis. Elvis. Yeah. 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 Elvis was like that. Elvis could just literally get a reaction by just like, instead of moving much of his body, just by going like that. Yes. Can we see the clip of your mother and Frank? You know, they're, they're, that's only a photo, it's only a photograph. Oh, okay. It's only a photograph. But that was taken at a birthday party for uh, Julie Rizzo. And uh, we got invited to the party, and I thought, we must take my camera. You got a picture of your mom with Dolly. That would have been, that been good, yeah. And I had a Nikon 2 camera, but no flash. So I went to the drugstore, <laughs> and I bought the highest, like, 1,200 whatever that yeah, thing is, ASA, 1200. So I put it in and I'm, I got the thing at the party. And <coughs> Frank had met my mother a couple times, so it wasn't like a big like, new deal. They're finally, my mother's no longer squealing. And uh, I said, may I take a picture? Frank says, sure. So I pull out the camera, he says, wait a second, where's the flash? He said, no, it's really high speed. 1200, I said, really? Yeah. And we have that picture. Yeah. So you remember Tony Danza's story? What's Tony's? Tony Danza tells the story that, uh, when he became young, he had one hit TV show, then another hit TV show, then a really great TV career. He had like 20 years of unbroken TV success. But his mother always said to him, you may think you're a star, but you're not a star until you can introduce me to Frank Sinatra. <laughs> <laughs> and he did. And he did. <laughs> I was a great, great, I actually introduced Frank Sinatra to my mother on Mother's Day. Ah. Yeah. It actually happened. It did. Yes. <laughs> Speak up. I have a very vague recollection of my, and I could be totally wrong, of my mother <coughs> telling me that she cut school to hear. Oh, practice. tons of kids did. Oh, yeah. sang in the daytime. He was doing At concerts. On I weekdays. will tell you what that was. Yeah, yeah we do it daytime. That was, yeah. a, that, was, that was a tradition before, uh, as an outgrowth of the big band era, that movie theaters 
would have stage shows. <coughs> and sometimes uh, they would almost always involve singers. Mm -hmm. And Sinatra originally, first with Harry James, then with Tommy Dorsey, then on his own, would play movie theaters. So you would see an hour long stage show that included, you know, a bunch of songs by Sinatra and then a movie and then a whole program of movies. So the whole program would be like three hours <laughs> and um, maybe more. And Sinatra and the band would do four, five, six, seven shows a day. But yeah, they had them in the daytime and kids would kids. cut school. Yeah. And what would happen, in, in my interview with Frank, I said, you know, my mother was there at the Paramount, and they would start out getting in late to be in the balcony, and after right. each show, they moved closer and closer and closer. When and Tony closer. Bennett was 16 years old, he would go to these, he would cut school and go to see Sinatra in Paramount. Yeah. 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 We talked about that. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a real thing. Will is going, I think we're, we're going to take a question from George, a couple more questions, and Will will be back there no. signing books. Oh, just Quick, because this is all ringing a bell with me. My mother was a singer, dancer. She went to Peoria Emanuel High School, which is the second largest high school in Illinois. And they raised money for her to go to Hollywood. And she decided to wait until um, September to go and took a job and, and wound up meeting my tractor salesman father to be. Um, but through her, I got interested in. in all kinds of music. I used to listen to William D. Williams on WDW mm -hmm. when I was like in my teens. And I'm working on my typewriter and listening, and my father came in, and there was a Sinatra song playing. And he said, Turn that off! <laughs> and I said, What? Well, I said, Turn that off! So later I said, Mom, what was going on? And she said, Well, I had a kind of crush on Frank Sinatra. <laughs> 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 So he had an impact. You know? I bet it was more than that. I bet there's something that I can't. <laughs> you have a question back, sir? Yeah. Good and loud, please. Um, I'm Frank. You were the first one to interview Mr. Sinatra. The only one. I, I, the only one. And yeah. My question is, how did you get him to do that? Oh, there's a whole tale. Oh, that's, uh, that's a tale. tale. You have to read Bill's book. There's a tale. <laughs> uh, can I, I'm going to do something. Well, I'll, I'll give, we're going to end this. We'll end on this tale. And there's uh, a lot of tale of Frank Sinatra's life. The, uh, I had, uh, ever since I saw Frank at the 500 Club, about three, four times a year, I'd have a recurring dream, a lovely dream, that I was sitting talking to Frank. And sometimes, as dreams are, it actually was Frank. Other times, it was somebody else, but it was always Frank in my mind. It was a lovely, I would wake up, oh, what a wonderful dream I was talking to Frank. So I was scheduled to leave uh, New York on Friday at the, doing midday live, fly out to Vegas, meet some friends, see Elvis early show and Frank late show on Saturday <laughs> night. Not like, a shabby like, night. like you do. Which we did. <laughs> However, the night before we left, I had the dream. And it was as vivid as it ever had been. I woke up and I felt that I had experienced a prescient dream. And I said to Paul Noble, the uh, executive producer of Midday, I have a sense that I'm going to meet Frank Sinatra and he's going to come and do Midday. And it happened. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I met him at 4 o'clock in the morning. I was introduced by Jilly, told him about the 500 Club, told him about my mother. We connected. I had seen the show. I came back the next night, Sunday night, saw the show. And it's been doing the 15 minute conversation, 4 o'clock in the morning. At the end, Frank said, Jilly says, you have a show on 5 in New York? Yeah. He said, well, I don't want to promise anything, but I'm going to be in New York <laughs> in September with Ella and Basie. Ooh. <laughs> and what do you think I said? And he said, nah, for God. With my hand up like this, I said, Frank, I'm not asking for anything. And he took my hands, and he looked me and he's Look me out with these cobalt blue eyes, and he said, "I know you're not Billy. Maybe, wow. I'll, maybe I'll come." I can show some. And he did. <laughs> That's it. Now the book we've been talking about here for you two is Sinatra. The song is you. A singer's art. Are we YouTube? Will Freewall, and that happens to be Will Freewall. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll be back there.